evening and a warm welcome to Empowering You for Victory. Love greetings from my Anne and I to all of you. Today we are studying about entering into the rest of God. Entering into the rest of God is also operating or living by the faith of God. It's a rest in the finished work of God. I want to read from Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 1. Let us therefore fear, lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest. Any of you should come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them. But the word preached did not profit them, not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. Can we pray? Father, in the name of Jesus, we want to thank you that you said in your word in Matthew eleven twenty eight, 28, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavily laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly of heart, and you'll find rest unto your souls. I pray, Father, that we will understand that Jesus, you are our Sabbath rest. And when we operate the faith of Jesus, we are operating from the position of the Sabbath rest of God. We give you the praise, the honor, and the glory. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. We saw on Sunday night, family, that the heart is the embodiment, if you will, or the home of your spirit and Christ or God's spirit. And when you get saved, God takes the hard heart of stone out of you. And he puts a soft heart, a tender heart, a heart of flesh. He gives you a new spirit. That's why if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. All things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. But then he puts his spirit within us. And his spirit now, it's a work of the spirit that causes you to walk in God's statutes and then you keep God's judgments and you actually do them. So it's not by might, it's not by power, but it's by the spirit. So here in the book of Hebrews, the Bible is showing us the journey of the nation of Israel from Egypt, coming out of Egypt by the blood of the Lamb, going through the wilderness, which was a training ground where God will teach them that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God doth man live. And so there's a proceeding word that man lives by. And then they cross Jordan. And Jordan is where Jesus was baptized. And it speaks of death, the baptism of death. And you come out on the other side into new life. And you cross over to enter into the promised land. Now, a whole nation and a whole generation perished in the wilderness and were not able to enter the promised land. And only a a younger generation that was born in the wilderness under the leadership of Joshua who was from Egypt and Caleb. And Joshua took them over. 
But in Hebrews chapter 3, the Bible says we must take heed. In other words, you must be careful now. Lest there be an evil heart of unbelief. And a hard heart through the deceitfulness of sin. That's speaking to the church. So it's telling us how the children of Israel didn't inherit the promised land because of unbelief and because of sin. And their hearts got hard and God actually swore they shall not enter into my rest. So we see that Christ is the fulfillment of a land flowing with milk and honey. And Christ is the Sabbath rest of God. So living by faith is living from a position of being in Christ Jesus. Living by faith is living from a position where you are in the promised land. Already, because Christ is our promised land. And we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And we are no more living by the law, but we are living by faith. It's by, f by grace through faith are you saved, not by keeping the law. The law was written on tablets of stone. But in the New Covenant, God writes upon the tablets of our heart. So our hearts are not hearts of stone. They are hearts that are soft. They are spiritual, humble hearts. And so God writes his laws. In the New Covenant, basically, it's just two laws that all the law and prophets, all the old covenant hang on, is the first one is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your mind, all your soul, and all your strength. That's the first and great commandment. And it's a commandment of the new covenant to love God. And we love him because he first loved us. And he came into our heart and he shed his love abroad our hearts. How did he shed it? By the Spirit, which is given. So the Holy Spirit is a spirit also of God. It's a spirit of love. And the spirit of love, when the Spirit comes into your heart, there's such an overflow of love from God that it's poured abroad all over your heart and in your heart there is an environment of love and we can see this love defined in 1 Corinthians 13 and without love operating the spirit man then everything the spirit man tries to do is futile whether it's speaking in tongues, whether it's sowing, or whether it's exercising your faith. So this love, which is God, which is shed abroad our hearts, is the fuel of our faith and the fuel of the new man in Christ Jesus. And so we thank God for the love of God. That's why we have known and believe the love that God has for us. And the love of God covers the multitude of sin. And so in the born again heart, the new heart, there's a new man and God in that heart. And the whole environment is an environment of love. Because wherever God is, there's just an overflow of the love of God. 
And I believe out of that overflow of God in your heart and an environment of heaven, an environment of the love, environment of godliness is created in your heart. Now, environment is very powerful. In fact, the Bible says the kingdom of God is righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Ghost. So we find that righteousness, peace, and joy is in the Holy Ghost. And the Holy Ghost is in your heart, which is given unto you. And so here you have the human spirit, who you are, the born-again man, the hidden man of the heart, who is living in the heart, and Christ is in the heart. For the Bible says that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith. So how does Christ dwell in your hearts by faith? By you living through Christ by faith. Who, Jesus. Every time you live by faith through Christ in your heart, Christ is dwelling in your heart, and Christ is being formed through your life. And you are fulfilling the mandate of God where you are created in the image and the likeness of God to reflect God in the earth and to be an ambassador for Christ, to be a God representative in the earth. It's all coming from your heart. But your heart is also the production center of your life. So whatever you put into your heart will bring forth out of that heart into your life. When Jesus taught about the parable of the sower sows the word, he spoke about different types of soil. And he said, the field is the heart. The soil is the heart. So that parable is a parable about the heart. And there are three different types of soils that are non-productive. There is a soil called a wayside soil. And it is a soil that the heart doesn't have understanding. If you don't have spiritual understanding, you are easily distracted by the devil from the Word of God. The Word of God doesn't take root, doesn't germinate in your heart. And so that's how the devil steals the word of God is by distracting you and you get distracted because you lack spiritual understanding. You lack revelation. Then the Bible speaks about the stony soil. Very interesting that the commandments were written on tablets of stone. Now, the stony soil, Jesus explained it, it's hearts that pick up offenses. It's hearts that got anger in there, and they got unforgiveness, and they are hurt. And so, there's no harvest from that heart. But the harvest that will come forth out of that type of heart is harvests of anger and offenses and unforgiveness because that is what you're going to speak. And that's what's going to come forth because you're going to have whatever you believe and whatever you say. And so you have beliefs of offenses beliefs of hurt, beliefs of anger. And uh, the anger of man cannot work the righteousness of God, which is your spirit. And love works the righteousness of God. And so that's why it's your responsibility to maintain your heart to be filled with love. And then the third type of soil that was not productive was thorny soil. Now, very interesting, the word of God or the, the seed was sown where the thorns were already in the soil. 
And so both grew, but the thorns choked the word, the, the, the plants of the good seed, which is the word of God. And it was non-productive. And that thorny soil speaks of worry, Jesus said, the cares of this world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. Money can deceive you, really. When you start loving money more than God, you start worshiping a golden calf, and you will bend, try to bend the word of God to ease your conscience because you don't want to serve God with your money. And yet, Jesus said it's so hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. It's as hard as a camel to go through the eye of a needle. But he said, with God, all things are possible. With man, it's impossible. And so, it's God's will for you to be wealthy. Jesus Christ was made poor that you through his poverty might be made rich. But so many people, as soon as they get rich, then that rich or the wealth, material wealth, begins to dictate their commitment to God. And they wouldn't say that, but slowly the wealth is taking the place of God in their hearts. And as soon as wealth becomes an idol, and an idol is anything that you love more than God, then that becomes the object of your worship, even though you may not say that. Satan tempted Jesus and said, if you fall down and worship me, I will give you all the kingdoms of this world because they've been delivered unto me. And Jesus rebuked him and said, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shalt thou serve. And so when Moses delayed on the mount to get the Ten Commandments, Aaron, a priest, the high priest, listened to the people. And they brought all their wealth and they melted it in the fire. And they made a golden calf. And they started dancing. And it's amazing what deceitful of riches can do to your life. And so you've got to learn how to harness your life, how to worship God with your money and not worship the money that God gave you and make the money that God gave you an idol. So that's why you're going to have to listen to God, how God is saying you must use your money. And that's possible, Jesus says. It's possible. Because he that is faithful in that which is least, which is money, is faithful in that which is most. You are a steward of all that God has entrusted into your life, whether it's your gifts or whether it's your finances. And so worry can pollute the heart. Deceitfulness of riches can pollute the heart. And then the lust of other things can pollute your heart. You just desire things that are not in line with the will of God for your life. They don't belong to the new creature. And one of those things is the deceitfulness of sin. Sin can harden your heart. The pleasures of sin, which is only for a season. And so you are a custodian of your heart. And that is why my text says very clearly here today, let us fear. In other words, let's have deep honor and respect. Lest a promise being left us of entering into his rest, any of you should seem to come short of it. For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word did not profit them, not being mixed with faith 
in them that heard it. So how can we mix faith without hearing when the word of God, the gospel is preached to us? Because that is how you can become a doer of the word of God. You mix faith with your hearing of the word of God. In 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 to verse 20, we have the answer to this. For as God is true, our word towards you was not yea and nay. So Paul is saying the word that he preached to the church was not yes and no. He says, for the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, even by me and Silvanus and Timotheus, was not yea and nay, but in him was yea. So you see, if we go back again and look at the illustration of the nation of Israel in the wilderness, God had given them the promised land. He had given it to them. It's their inheritance. But God also said, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that I have I also given unto you. So you see, God has given you Christ, and all that is in Christ, he is the gift that keeps on giving. And God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called you unto glory is goodness and virtue is excellence, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these you may be partakers of his divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. So you find the way you can have an ongoing walk of faith, an ongoing living in Christ, an ongoing living in the promised land, an ongoing living in the rest of God. It's through the promises of God. So we live by believing the promises of God that they have been fulfilled. Because that's what the rest of God is, is God finished his work from before the foundations of the world. Now it's very, very powerful when you read in Genesis chapter 1 the creation story that in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth but verse 2 says and the earth was without form and void and darkness was upon the face of the deep then the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and then verse 3 says and God said let there be light we find that in the creation or restoration story, or creation and restoration, that God released light before he created the sun and the moon and the stars. And that light is Jesus Christ. That light is the word of God. The Bible says the entrance of thy word Give it light and understanding to the simple. And so God's word is God's life. God's word is God's breath. God's word is God's light. God's light is God's glory. So when God says, let there be light... He says, let the glory cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. That's what God has done. Now, if you look at each day of creation, there's the first day, the second day, the third day, the fourth day, the fifth day, and we get to the sixth day. 
all through those days of creation and putting order into creation, man was not part of that equation. Isn't that interesting? And it's only in the, on the sixth day that God created man when he had finished his works. And then he breathed into man's nostrils and man became a living being. Then God took man and put him into a garden that God had also planted. Very interesting that he didn't say man to plant the garden. Didn't tell man to plant the garden of Eden. God planted the garden of Eden. And God put man before the tree of life. And God said of all these trees, you may eat freely. But of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you must not eat of it. For the day you eat of it, you shall die. So there was an environment of abundance there. There was an environment of all the work being finished from before the foundation of the world. And then the Bible says on the seventh day, God rested. So man began in the rest of God. A point I'm telling you that God didn't need man to create anything. And you're going to have to believe that God doesn't need you to do anything that he has already done for you. He did it for you, not with you. And he gave it to you. And all he said to Adam that now you must look after what I've given to you but you must look after it from a position of rest. So that means to enter into the rest of God is our faith life. We must labor to enter into the rest of God. And how do you labor? What, what's that labor? You're not laboring in faith, laboring to get a certain level of faith or something like that. No, you grow your faith and you develop your faith. It's not burdensome at all. It's a joy to do it. You're not trying to twist God's hand, neither are you trying to grab something from God. No, 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 a million times no. God deals, gives to every one of us the measure of faith, but we develop it and we grow it. So everything that God gives you, you have to maintain it. It's the law of maintenance. And if you don't maintain it, there's disorder. But everything that God gives you has an ability to increase and multiply. That in whatever God gives you is your harvest. And in your harvest is seed to sow and bread to eat. And so God put him in a garden and he made him look after this garden. That was the instruction. Just look after Tend and keep it. Guard it. Now I've been saying to you that garden is your heart. You didn't need God to give you a new, you didn't help God to give you a new heart. You didn't need God to help God to cause you to be born again. You didn't need to help God for, your, for his spirit to come within you. All you needed to do is believe. You believed in Jesus. And that's how God wants us to live as believers. As doers of the word of God. And then when we believe and we do the word of God, the faith of God is released in different dimensions according to how we have lived by the word of God. And so you can grow your faith and you can develop your faith. But it's not your faith, it's God's faith in any case. So everything that God ever gave you, everything that you ever need to live a godly life, it's a gift from God. And it's your responsibility to look after your heart. Look after your garden of Eden. Now, 
you can see that Adam allowed Satan into the garden. God didn't put Ad, uh, Satan there. Uh, Adam had to keep Satan out. Adam's mandate was to Edenize the whole earth, heavenize the whole earth through the word of faith, through believing and confessing. And of course, you've got to work, you've got to go to work, you've got to study, you can't just lie on your bed. No, you've got to do all the necessary things in life, but do it from a position of faith. Do it from a position of believing. Do it from a position of glory. Do it from a position of excellence of God. And then you are doing it from a position of rest. And then it's a joy because the commandments of God are not grievous. Now the two commandments is to love your Lord, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and then to love your neighbor as yourself. On those two commandments, though, that's a royal law of love. It's a law of kings and priests, of the royal priesthood. And so on those two commandments, which is a joy, and God puts his love in your heart for you to be able to love God with God's love, to be able to love humanity with God's love, Everything you do is got to be through God, in God. And, and God is your life. And, and your life is hid with Christ in God. And so it's God 24-7 all the way, God and his sons. So as I draw this to a close, the word of God is not yes sometimes and no sometimes. It's always yes. And then verse 20 tells us so beautifully, and I close with this, 2 Corinthians 1.20, for all the promises of God in him, that's in Christ, in God, can you see that? Ah, yes. That means it's got to be in Christ. Because it's in Christ where the word is fulfilled. And in Christ all those promises are yes, and you are in Christ, and Christ is in you. So God is saying to you today, he is saying yes to you. But it goes on to say here, I yea, in him I yea, and in him amen. Unto the glory of God, there is that word, by us. Can you see the amen must be given by your human, born again, spirit that's intermingled with God. So God's spirit in your heart says yes. And while you're in God, through God, in Christ, through Christ, you from your spirit must say, so be it. That means I agree with everything that God gave me from before the foundations of the world. And I receive everything that God gave me from before the foundations of the world. Let me read uh, one or two or three translations and we close. The Amplified Bible says, for as many as are the promises God, of God, they all, all find their yes answer in him, in Christ. So all the promises are yes in Christ. For this reason, we also utter the amen. God utters the yes, but we, our responsibility, we believe, and therefore we say amen to God, through him, in his person, and by his agency, to the glory of God, and the God gets all the praise. Isn't that powerful? Then if another translation, I think it's the TPT, for all God's promises find their yes of fulfillment in him, in Christ. And as his yes, and our amen, ascend to God, we bring him glory. So God gets glory when you live by faith. Then the last one is for, 
For no matter how many promises God has made, they are yes in Christ. And so through him, the amen is spoken by us to the glory of God. And so my friend, as we close this evening of empowering you for victory, you're going to have to know the promises of God. You're going to have to have a man of God that feeds you the promises that are always yes. You need someone to teach you the yes of God. When someone teaches you the yes of God, God says in your heart, yes. But if the promises are also in your heart, your spirit must say amen. What does amen mean? So be it. So to every promise that God says yes, your spirit's responsibility is to say, so be it. We find this in the life of Mary, where the angel said to her, you are highly favored. You're going to bring forth the son, son of God. She says, how are these things going to be, seeing I know no man? And then the angel said, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and overshadow you. And that which is born of you shall be called, that precious thing will be called the Son of God. And so, friend, Jesus Christ is a manifested word. The word was made flesh and dwelt amongst us. And now that Jesus has been sown and his body has been raised, now the body of Christ becomes a manifested word. And the way that manifestation of glory takes place is every time the Spirit says yes in your heart, witnesses in your heart, through a man of God preaching you, the word of God, through you meditating on the promises of God, then your responsibility is to receive that word, to conceive that word. And when you receive it, you are saying, Amen, so be it. So every time I preach to you, don't hold back your amens. Don't hold back saying, I receive. Don't hold back saying from your heart, I believe it's mine. And as you say that, then the manifestation of glory will take place in your life. God richly, richly bless you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I want to say a few promises to you. And I want you to say amen to it. Because if your heart is open, they'll go through your ear right into your heart. And the Spirit of God will say yes to you. And as you have that yes witness, you say amen. And then the Spirit and the bride are actually in intimacy and union together in Jesus' name. The first promise I make to you is that you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor that you through his riches, through his poverty, might be made rich. Therefore, I decree and declare over your life, you are rich through the poverty of Jesus, getting you to the riches of Christ. You are a wealthy, wealthy king priest in the earth. What do you say? Amen! I receive it! It's mine! That's treading upon your promised land now in the name of Jesus. Isaiah 53, if you have sickness in your body, he was wounded for your transgression. He was bruised for your iniquities. The chastisement of your peace was upon Jesus Christ. And by Jesus Christ's stripes, you 
are healed. 1 Peter 2.24 declares, Who his own self bore your sins in his body on the tree, that you being dead to sins live unto righteousness, by whose stripes you were healed. Therefore, as your man of God, under the order of Melchizedek, I decree over your life that you are dead to sin. You live unto righteousness. And by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. What do you say? Shout it out from your heart. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Shout the victory sounds out. In the master laba, in the master laha, nesto kapashtelebenda. It's yours. You're possessing your possessions. You're treading on every promise that God has given you. God richly bless you. I'm so excited to teach you how to inherit your inheritance. Man, I'm going to give you the opportunity to sow a powerful seed. This is a powerful word. You sow a powerful seed. Make the transaction, sow the seed. I'll be back in a moment to receive it and to pray for you. And in the name of Jesus, you sow the seed. You do the transaction right now in the name of Jesus. The banking details are coming up on the screen. And you do that transaction right now and listen to this beautiful song while you do it. And I'll be back in a moment. Thank you. God bless you. for sowing your precious seed. Thank you for your tithes and offerings. And as a ministry operating under the order of Melchizedek, I decree and declare over your life that my God supplies all your needs, your dreams, your desires according to how rich he is in Christ Jesus, how rich he is in glory. By Christ Jesus, in Jesus' name, walk in the riches, walk in the wealth. Think it, believe it, act it. You're a wealthy son of God, in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. God bless you. See you Sunday in a wonderful service together. Amen. Bye-bye.